friends, colleagues, um, as Head of Teacher Education, uh, it's my great delight to invite uh, you all to uh, welcome Steve Mumby, CBE, um, to um, introduce his uh, distinguished lecture. Um, and he's going to reflect on his journey as a, a leader. Um, and uh, Steve is an educationalist. He's spent his whole career in education, um, which I definitely think deserves a medal. <laughs> and um, so he speaks with a very deep level of understanding and professional wisdom that he has uh, accrued across those various roles that he's held. Um, I am uh, nearly at the end of the book. Uh, uh, the title here, Imperfect Leadership, and uh, it's an, an amazing uh, uh, insight into um, how, how education changes and, um, and how uh, leaders uh, manage that, uh, that journey and that change and everything that goes on. Um, Steve started out as a teacher and moved from schools uh, to an advisory role and a, a, an inspector and then became a director of education in Nosley, which said 15 years ago now, uh, then chief ex uh, executive of the National College of School Leadership, which did a lot of uh, very um, important work at the time, and then latterly chief executive of um, the Education Development Trust. So I think kind of a, a massive range of, of system leadership that Steve has been involved in and influenced, um, and that, um, I'm sure you agree, is impressive. Um, and I think his ability to reflect on that with some insights and uh, some inspiration for us, um, well, we're very grateful that you're willing to share that and, the, um, and a very generous um, uh, generous of you to do so because as leaders you know we appreciate and we can learn lessons from uh, listening to the lessons learned by others and, uh, and I think that's a really important aspect. Um, so he has definitely walked the walk in terms of uh, leadership and it's going to be good to hear tonight to talk about that and um, about the kind of the different and the very diverse facets of, um, of leadership from uh, the authorities right through, I know, to an international perspective, so there's lots there. Um, as uh, the university, teacher education and education department, as educationalists, we recognise the key role uh, that our school leaders play in a very increasingly complex and fast-paced, changing sort of fluid system, uh, quite unique, I think, in some ways to England. So um, it's it's very important to us that we support our leaders and we try and do that in a variety of ways and this is a very nice way in which I hope um, we offer our leaders a chance to hear someone and get some insights um, and have a chance to think and reflect and maybe ask some questions um, around uh, leadership that you might have some burning questions to put before uh, Steve. So um, we're looking forward to hearing about uh, your insights and um, I certainly for one uh, are very encouraged by the title Imperfect Leadership and uh, I think it's something I can um, definitely recognise and um, I think it's uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting talk. So, um, Thank you. Everyone, welcome to you. Well, it's great to be back in one of my favourite cities. Um, as kind of you heard, I, I worked as Director of Education in Nelson for five years, had a fabulous time, not without the challenges, but we had a fabulous time there, uh, and I, I love being here in Liverpool. Uh, I'm not an academic, I'm not a researcher, but I have been a leader of large education organisations. So I was Director of Education in Nelson for five years, and then I was Chief Executive of the National College of School Leadership in England. And then I was for eight years, and then I was five years as Chief Executive of Education Development Trust. So I'm going to talk with you this evening about leadership. And I've written a book, and it's called Imperfect Leadership. And because when I was thinking about my own leadership over all those 17 years, leading organisations, it's the best term I could use to describe my own leadership. And it's not something I'm ashamed of or embarrassed about. I'm actually proud to be. So I have a problem with this notion of perfect leadership. I think if we think we have to be perfect as leaders, we'll do our heads in. 
or make ourselves mentally or physically ill. If we think that to be perfect as leaders, we won't uh, devolve responsibility to others, we'll just do it all ourselves. If we think we have to be perfect as leaders, we want to <coughs> other people to step up because they have to be perfect too. And since no one is perfect, no one will want to become a leader. So I want to speak in praise this evening of imperfect leadership. In the book, the book does three things. It, um, it's, it talks about my own leadership journey in some honesty. It talks about weaknesses, problems, mistakes, as well as good things. It also, uh, every year, for 12 consecutive years, I do a big speech in Birmingham in front of uh, more than 1,000 school leaders on school leadership. Since it was the same people coming every year, it had to be a different speech on the every year. So those 12 speeches, I've, I've sort of done, edited summaries of those 12 speeches. And the other thing that the book does is it analyzes what was happening in education in England from 2005 through to the present day, especially the time I was working closely with um, two secretary of states in particular, that was Ed Balls and Michael Gove. So that's what the book does. Uh, and e each chapter has a song lyric to introduce the chapter. And those of you who are uh, young will not even have heard of these people. <laughs> if there's any my age, you might have heard of these people. So the first song is many of the times I've been mistaken and many times confused by Paul Simon, which describes a lot of my leadership, to be honest. The second one is You Need Me, Need You, Need Him, Need Everyone by Lindisfarne, which uh, the increasing as I read, it, it was clear to me that we can't do anything unless we work collaboratively within and outside our organization. The third one was You've Got to Wake Up Every Morning with a Smile on Your Face by Carol King, because sometimes that's exactly what the leader needs to be able to do whatever people are finding it so challenging. We've got to be optimistic. We've got to be positive. The fourth one is, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there by Bob Dylan. <laughs> and that's about the, those dark night of the soul times. And I will talk about that towards the end of my speech. Uh, and the last one is, when all parts of the puzzle start to look like they fit. Because sometimes in leadership, it comes together. And you actually really can do some fantastic things when it all comes together. So. The talk this evening is about imperfect leadership, and I think there are ten aspects to it. And the first one is, imperfect leaders know their strengths and their weaknesses. Uh, when, I was, when I was at the National College of School Leadership, we have something called NPQH. It's the National Professional Qualification for Headship. And in those days, it was a requirement. You could not become a head teacher unless you were on the program. The problem was with it, it was too easy. People had the qualification, but weren't ready for headship. And it was damaging the brand, so we had to find a way of making it harder to get. And one of the ways we made it harder, we introduced a new process whereby anyone who wanted to go on the program had to do the 360 feedback. They had to get feedback from their colleagues about the kind of leader that they were. And when they got that feedback back to them from the independent facilitator, if they welcomed the feedback, accepted it, and wanted to work on their weaknesses, they got on the program. If they did not recognize the feedback, or were defensive about the feedback, they didn't get on the program. Because our view was, self-awareness is a key quality for good leaders. Uh, but this self-awareness stuff is actually quite deep. It's not shallow. We used to use something called the iceberg model in the old days which says that this, this, your skills and knowledge, which everyone can see and everyone's aware of, but underneath the surface, there's other stuff about you as a leader, which might be about how you see yourself as a leader, what you value in yourself, your non-conscious patterns of behavior, and what motivates you. And we, we've that made up four heading, four key questions, really. The first is, what knowledge, experience, and skills do I have that make me an effective leader, and where are the gaps? That's pretty clear cut, we can work on those. What do I think others want and expect from me as a leader? How do I know and am I happy with that? Sometimes when we find ourselves in a job where the expectations based upon us as leaders, there's no match there to what actually the kind of leader we want to be. Third one, what am I like when I'm tired? How do I behave when I'm stressed? What are my default me mechanisms? What am I, what I how do I behave when I'm under pressure? And am I aware of that and can I mitigate that? That's a deeper self-awareness. Can I sort of stop myself getting overstressed because I see the warning sign? 
And the fourth one is what motivates me as a leader. Why am I doing this? Uh, after 17 years of leading big organizations, uh, I'm clear about my two motivations. One was uh, making a difference, and the other was not being a failure. Those are the two drivers for me. I wasn't always worried about getting the sack, uh, as well as wanting to make a difference. Those are the two big drivers for me. So self-awareness is really important. So once you've got a deeper self-awareness, you can start to develop a leadership style. They just need to develop their own leadership style based on their beliefs and values, their expertise and skills, and their personality. But context matters, so our leadership has to change as our context changes. Now this is a crucial one. Everyone knows when you go from being a leader in one organisation to being a leader in another organisation, you can't just be exactly the same person you were in the last place. And talk about what we did in the last place. It goes down really badly. You've got to think your way into your new organisation and your new context. Of course everyone understands that. But what is more <laughs> challenging is this. You can be in exactly the same job, in exactly the same organisation, and your context can change. The sigmoid curve explains this. It says most organisations improve, they start off, they improve, they grow, they reach the top and then they start to decline again. If you recognise that, and start changing things before you get to the top, you can have an inflection point and you can get further improvement. If you don't recognise it until you're coming down the other side, it's much harder to change things, it's more painful to change things. I put that up because at least twice in my leadership I got this badly wrong. At least twice in my leadership I got this badly wrong. I was doing what I had been doing pretty well, and I've not realised enough that the external context had changed and it required me to be a different kind of leader for a while. Now, it's easy to see that in retrospect. It's much harder to see it at the time. But the key question you must ask yourselves as leaders is this. What kind of leader do I need to be now in January 2020 compared to the kind of leader I needed to be a year ago? What's, is there anything changing in my context, externally or internally, that means a different kind of leadership is now required of me that wasn't that needed from me a year ago? It's a constant challenge to get that right. That's self-awareness within your context. And the final thing that changes are the people. Uh, new people coming in, other people leaving, can make a big difference to the dynamics uh, of an organisation. I don't know whether you've seen this diagram from Pendleton and Furnham. It says there are, there are staff in your organisation who behave really well, who are, who are credit to the organisation, who live the values, and staff maybe who have got questionable values or don't behave well. There are staff who are highly effective and deliver on the outcomes and maybe ones who don't, uh, aren't as effective. And that divides up into four rough kind of groups of people. Over here you have the sloths on the left hand side there. They neither behave well nor perform well. Now the kind of way you want to lead them is different from the kind of way you're going to lead some of these other people. Because because you either change them or you remove or neutralize them. Because they're bad news for the organization. So you're going to be quite uh, commanding, authoritative with them after you put support in them. You're going to have some very challenging conversations with them. The saints are delightful. They're lovely people. They're just not as effective as they ought to be or you want them to be in the job. So there you're going to be a coach. You're going to be, a, you're going to be, um, you're going to be um, modeling the kind of things you want from them, and you're going to get them involved in, in some development work to improve their skills and their knowledge. The, the, the sinners are the hardest group to do, because they actually get good outcomes for you, but there's something not quite right about the way they behave. They're, they're not good for the culture of the organisation. And for them, you're going to have some <coughs> challenging conversations with them about their behaviour, because you can't afford to let that make the culture toxic. And finally, you've got the stars, who are the most people in the organisation, and you're not going to be having a challenging conversation with them. You're going to be trying to help them to fly. You're going to recognise them. You're going to have to stretch them. You're going to be, you're going to be listening to what they have to say, and learning from them, and, and empowering them. So even within uh, the organisation, you're going to be having different leadership approaches, depending on the people that you're leading, based on understanding your own strengths and your weaknesses. The second aspect of, of imperfect leadership is that you... Um, you try to point people who know better things than you are. 
You don't try and be the perfect leader, you try to create a perfect team. That's the aim. Uh, I was talking to a head teacher a few months ago. He said, I regard myself as a bungalow and I want to appoint skyscrapers. I want to appoint people who are better than me, who have far more skills than I have. And that's part of my job as a leader, he said. And in addition to that, I'm perfectly clear the science is not all about that. Why should it be? It's better to be right at the end of a process than to be seen to be right at the beginning. They therefore empower their team uh, and um, share out responsibility. I just want to talk a little bit about this one. Um, I wrote in the book 10 reasons why leadership teams go wrong. All based on my own experience, by the way. 10 reasons why leadership executive teams go wrong. And I'm only going to mention five of them here because you can read the book if you want to find the other five. <laughs> but the first one is the CEO keeps too much control. They, um, they delegate tasks, work, delegate work, but don't delegate responsibility. Everything is kept in control of the center. And the team waits for the CEO to make all the decisions. I, I was coaching a uh, CEO, a very impressive CEO of a big organization. And she asked me a couple of years ago to go and watch her operating with her senior team because she had a few issues. So I sat and observed her working with her senior team for the morning. And it was quite shocking, really, because she kept asking them questions to get their views, and they didn't, they didn't give any views. And these are quite talented people, but they just didn't respond much. So after she left, I, I had a chat with the team. I said, why was that happening? They said, ah, I said, we've learned that when she asks us a question, she already knows the answer. <laughs> and if we give the wrong answer, we get told it's the wrong answer. And so we've worked out it's best to wait until she gives us the right answer. So that's why we behave the way we do. That was really interesting because she, she was not empowering. She was a very bright woman. She was very strategic, very clever, but she was not empowering a team. So that's one reason why teams can go wrong. The second one is people think it's the CEO's meeting or the head teacher's meeting or the vice chancellor's meeting. And therefore, the best you can hope for is they'll read the papers before the meeting. That's the best you can hope for. You, what you won't get is a sense of collective responsibility for the, for the team. Collective responsibility for making the meeting go well. The default position is always, always, it's the, it's the CEO's meeting or the head teacher's meeting. So if you want to change that, you've got to work really, really hard to do that. To make sure everyone has got responsibility to bring to the meeting that you're thinking carefully about that in advance, so it's not just the default position to rely on the head teacher or the CEO. I had this, this a constant battle in all three organizations that I left to get that right. Third one, people are there because of their role rather than their expertise. Of course, if you have an executive team, the people who are there are the CEO, the deputy CEOs, etc. If you have a school, the head teacher, deputy head, or assistant head. That's how it works. The trouble is, at any given meeting, the issues you're discussing may be something where people in the room are not the experts. There may be someone else in the organization who's the expert, but you haven't invited them to the meeting because they're not on the team. And I, I had this a lot. I, I made this mistake quite a lot. You, you want to avoid that. You think carefully, what are we going to discuss at this meeting and who needs to be there, rather than it's the same people every week. So you think about the expertise you need in the room to make that decision as opposed to the decision on another issue or another aspect. And that's a hard one to get right. It takes a lot of thinking ahead to get that right. The fourth one is poor behavior. College starts turning up late. More people start turning up late. It becomes part of the culture. It's not people start being rude to a colleague or about a colleague or rude about a student or a parent. And you have to, before you know it, you've got a culture that's not a positive culture within your, within your team. So you have to address that. You have to. Uh, not to say in the meeting, you talk to the person who's been rude or turned to blame, and you make sure that doesn't happen again. It's really important that you do that. And the final one, I'm just going to dwell on a little bit. It's about trust. Now, it's a key issue. If you want a team to work well together, you, there has to be a sense of trust between the team. Now, if you read Patrick Lencioni's book on the five dysfunctions of a team, 
He says, the way things go wrong mainly is through lack of trust. If there's an absence of trust, people aren't open about what they think. That creates a fear of conflict and artificial harmony. What you'll get then is lack of commitment and ambiguity and vagueness. What you get then is avoidance of accountability and low standards. And finally, you get inattention to results and it's all about me rather than about the organisation. All because of an absence of trust <coughs> that it's not addressed, it's not, uh, it's not engaged in. And what Lencioni says, and this is really important, if you have a team that has trust, these are the behaviours you'll see, those. Now, all of those are about being an imperfect leader. Every single one of those is the qualities of an imperfect leader who knows that they're not an expert, who knows they don't know it all, who asks for help, who invites feedback, who offers apologies. If you don't have that kind of behaviour in your team, you'll get something like this going on. Circle of trust. So you'll have, you'll have C and D, who you're really close to, and you trust a lot, uh, and you can cut corners with them, you, you love working with them. You then have E and B, who are okay, there's no problems, not quite as trusting as, as, as C and D. And then you've got A. Well, there's just no trust. More isolated, and there's a breakdown there. And if you want to do something about A, that's what you have to do. That is the way to build trust. If you're, as a leader, not modelling that, if that's not how you're modelling it, you won't build trust within the organisation, unless you're very lucky. Now, I'm, I've got a colleague, a friend colleague, who runs a big national charity, CEO of a big national charity. And what he's done, he's been there six and a half years, He's, he's got all his team to do 360 feedback, including him. And he's identified two leadership areas for his own development. And every month, he's asking for feedback from his team. Now, I think that's a really powerful thing to do as a leader. And I said, oh, that's a brave thing to do. He said, yeah, I couldn't have done it in my first two years. So now, six and a half years in, I'm confident enough to know what I'm doing, and confident also enough to know that I don't know a lot of things that could be better at them. And that's a great place to be. So he's asking for feedback. Okay, so building a team based on trust is really, really important. It has to be modeled by the leaders. The next one is imperfect leaders are invitational. They ask for help and are prepared to admit that they need it. Now, invitational leadership is probably my main leadership style. I don't think I did it through careful thought. I just sort of instinctively behaved like that. Turns out it's a great leadership style. It's a really powerful and effective leadership staff to be an invitational leader. Because what it does if you're an invitational leader, it builds collective behaviours and sends a collective responsibility. And I'll give you an example of this. You know when you're the head teacher or the CEO or the leader of a team, you're supposed to have a vision. You're supposed to, you're not supposed to turn up on your first day and say, well, I don't know. But, but, People expect you to have some kind of vision for how you're going to move the organisation forward. The trouble is, they also expect to connect with that vision and they expect to have some ownership of that vision. So it's a hard one to get right. When I went to the National College for School Leadership, uh, <clears throat> I got all the staff together, my, just before I started, all the staff together, a big room, and I told them this story. I said, my wife and I had heard that the view in Santorini, the Greek island, of the white buildings and the blue sea and the extinct volcano rising up out of the sea in the blue sky was one of the most beautiful views in the whole world. We'd even seen photographs of it. So we decided to go and see it for ourselves. So we got on the flame to Santorini, got off in Santorini, got on a minibus, take us to the cliff edge to see this wonderful view. And that's what we saw. <laughs> we couldn't see a thing. Now we knew that the sea would be blue and the white buildings will be sparkling, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the extinct volcano will be rising up out of the sea, and the sky will be blue. We have to wait for the mist to clear. So I said to the staff at the National College, I have this vision for what the National College can be like. It can, it's going to be a bit like this, it's going to be a bit like this, and a bit like this. But it's a misty vision. It's a misty vision. And I want us to work together 
to clear the mist. And this notion of the set of our Buddha law sorted here is, I've got some ideas, but I need your ideas too to make it work. And that's invitational leadership, and that builds a sense of collective responsibility. There's a famous story of the mayor of Oklahoma City. On New Year's Day, he had a press conference. He said, people, and the cameras are all there, television cameras, people of Oklahoma City, he said, I've been trying for years to lose weight without success. Now, on New Year's Day, I'm asking for your help. That year, the mayor lost loads of weight. But so did the rest of Oklahoma City. The average weight in Oklahoma City went down that year because they're so identified with the mayor and wanted to help him, they all went on diets. And the average weight went down that year. So if you ask for help, you build a sense of collective responsibility. It's a very powerful thing to do as a leader. The other thing it does is it gets you better answers, better solutions, better strategies for asking for help. Now I'm going to show you a photograph. And one or two of you might, might even remember this photograph. This is the uh, education officers in Nosley before it was knocked down. But I, was, uh, I worked there for five years on the top, I was on the top floor there. Uh, and my view from the window was the McDonald's and the car park. Now I worked there for five years, some of you will, will know it. And uh, I had a great time. And I went straight from that job as Director of Education in Nosley to being Chief Executive of the National College of School Leadership. And that became my office. I don't know if they ever went there, but it had a lake and a moat. It had swans on the lake and the occasional heron. It had a bar, that's a bar. It had 100 bedrooms and a restaurant. It was a completely different experience for me. And, this, uh, and I was told when I got the job that one of my roles was to advise the Secretary of State about school leadership. I'd never even met a Secretary of State before. I had no idea. I had no idea. I was completely out of my depth. Now, you've got two choices to do in that situation. One is you can just bluff and hope you get away with it. Or two, you can ask for help. And in my view, what you should do is ask for help. And that's what I did. I decided that I needed four mentors. And I chose them very carefully. The first one was Estelle Morris, who was the former Secretary of State for Education. And I asked her to be my mentor because she would help me understand how government worked, what ministers were behaving like and what officials, the whole machinery of government. She helped me enormously in that respect. My second uh, mentor was a guy called Tim Brickhouse, who had run director, he'd been director of education in Birmingham, and then he went to be, run the London Challenge. And he was a guy with a great strategic mind and also great moral purpose. And I wanted to make sure I held on to those two things, strategy and moral purpose. The third person I had as my mentor was a guy called Tony McKay. And he was the best networker I knew. Because I knew if I was going to be successful in the job, I had to meet all the key people who could do us good or do us harm. And I knew that someone <coughs> introduced me to all these key people, and he performed that role for me brilliantly. And the fourth mentor I had was a guy called David Albury, who had written the report commissioned by the government on the National College for School Leadership a few months earlier. And it was quite a critical report. So I figured if he knew what the problems were, he could mentor me to help me to find the solution. So those were my four mentors. I could not have done the job without those people. I could not have done the job without those people. So this is my challenge to you. Why would anyone want to be a leader at a school or an organization and not have mentors? Why would anyone want to think about that? Why would anyone want to do that? It's crazy to think you can do it without mentoring. Secondly, why would you not have more than one? Why not have more than one? I have four. In fact, all my time as a leader, I had more than one. Thirdly, why would you think you have it for one or two years and then you'll stop? I needed mentoring right through my leadership to the very end. I sometimes changed my mentors because my needs changed, but it was really important for me to have mentoring right through because what they gave me was an external perspective because you can get so close to the organization, you don't see it properly. So first of all, choose your own mentor. Make sure they have expertise that you haven't got. And don't think you only have to have one. And why get rid of them? Keep them or change them, but have mentoring right through your leadership. Asking for help is really powerful. It helps to lead to better decisions. Next one. Imperfect leaders make use of their strengths, but also know their weaknesses. They understand that if they're working with other people, they'll have weaknesses too. So they try to lead with a combination of power in their leadership and love in their leadership. 
And I've left this a really important one for me, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one. It's based on a quote from Martin Luther King, who said, Power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. It's a really important quote that I think. Power without love is reckless and abusive, love without power is sentimental and anemic. And what I'm arguing here is that power is the drive to achieve one's purpose, to get things done, to push things to a conclusion. And love brings people together, connects people, unites people. Unless we've got power and love in our leadership, we won't be effective. And we understand our own weaknesses, so we'll understand those weaknesses too. That's why the love side is so important. So by power, I mean being driven, hasty, relentless, indomitable. By ch challenging others, having high expectations, calling people to account, being assertive, confident, and determined. That's the power side of leadership. The love side of leadership being kind, inclusive, collaborative, building relationships, being invitational, asking for help, empowering others, showing compassion, being humble, and demonstrating empathy. Each power and love are both important in leadership. Without power in your leadership, you will not see change through. You will not improve your organization. You might have a nice time, you might be friendly, but you're not going to uh, drive improvement for the organization. It's essential to have power in leadership, otherwise you won't be improving the organization. I love this quote. Once commitment is made, the goal will seem larger, bolder, more exciting. Leaders need to fix it up like a laser beam. They see it intently, even obsessively. They feel it, they hear it, they taste it, they smell it. It becomes part of them, their very identity. Something they're committed to make happen, come what may, whatever it takes. If there's not at least one thing in your leadership, well, that's true of you. If it's a school, it would be about making sure that children get their very, very, very best education. But there's something in your leadership that's absolutely driving you to, to make sure it happens. Because it's so important. And you're clear about that. And you're absolutely committed to it. Without that, if you, if you have that and you haven't got it anymore, it's a problem. You need that. It's essential that you'll be wanting to improve the organization. I'm going to tell you a story. My wife and I bought a house about 15 years ago in Manchester. And um, w when we moved in, we drew up a list of all the things that were completely unacceptable in that house and had to change. And we spent the first year, it's with some enthusiasm, working through that list. We got about two-thirds of the way down the list, and then we stopped. There were two reasons why we stopped. The first one was we ran out of money. But the second reason we stopped, we stopped noticing the things that initially we said were unacceptable. We just got used to them. We lowered our expectations. That crack on the windowsill stayed for 15 years. We walked past it without even noticing it. It just became part of the environment. This happens in leadership. You go in with high expectations, you want the very best, and gradually you just lower it. You just get used to the status quo. It's a dangerous place to be. So having that drive to keep expecting the best, to keep having those high expectations, the power side of leadership is so important. Then you can have leaders who have the power side leading out in front, but no one's following them because they haven't got the love side. Because the love side of leadership is being kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle, said Plato. Few people live simple and complicated lives. Few children and few adults live simple and complicated lives. You have no idea what's going on in their own lives. And yet you as a leader are asking for their loyalty and their commitment. Unless you show empathy and love in your leadership, you, you may not have that. Uh, it's a key part of it. It's interesting, there was a study about three years ago from the Department of Education looking at workload and teachers. And um, by the way, workload and teachers in England is at the far end of the extreme. It's really it's one of the worst in the world in terms of the hours that teachers work here compared to other systems. Um, and they found that about half the teachers they interviewed wanted to leave or weren't happy. And about half were happy to stay and wanted to stay and enjoyed their job. And in the end, when they analysed it, it had nothing to do with the number of hours they were working. They were all working hard. The ones who wanted to stay felt value in the work that they were doing, uh, felt the leadership understood their work and valued their work, felt as if they were part of something bigger than just what they were doing in their own classroom. And the ones who wanted to go didn't feel that. So how we lead, the culture we create, of what people want to know from you most of all is that you 
understand the work that they're doing and value them for the work that they're doing. It's a really big driver in people. Understand your work and be valued by the leaders in the organization. So how you create that environment of being valued and being listened to is very, very important. There's an ancient African proverb which says, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk together. That's a really interesting proverb because actually we want both, don't we? We don't want to say, well, we'll wait five years, it might get better. Children, when you get one education, you can't wait five years for that. So you want to have see improvements quickly. So sometimes you have to do really brave things that are going to be quite very challenging and might make you feel a bit isolated for a while. But unless you take people with you, you won't build sustainable improvement. Now, there was a study by um, uh, some, an organization called the Center for High Performance, which took place three years ago, looking at 165 academies in England. And they asked the question, what does a head teacher do to help to improve the school, and what happens when they leave? And it, you, you might have read about it. It was in the Harvard Business Review. It was well reported in the media. And they came up with five types of leader. One was the soldier, and one was the accountant. But the three I want to talk about uh, are the philosopher first. The philosopher. The philosophers, according to this study, they were very nice. They told the children and the staff they were wonderful. They, were, uh, they, they gave them staff opportunity to network and learn. Really positive and kind. The trouble was the organization didn't improve. Behavior was still bad. Parents were on board. Uh, and it was a, ended up being a very bad place. So the philosopher was lo very loving, kind, supportive, but not leading to improvement. The second kind of leader they got they called was the surgeon. The surgeon was the turnaround people. They're brought in to, to change the organization quickly. And they focus entirely, according to this study, on the accountability system. If it's a secondary school, they're looking at examination results and Ofsted. They're trying to make sure that their, their, their best teachers are in the exam classes. They're trying to off-roll kids who aren't going to do well in the exam and asking them to encourage them to go to another school. Uh, they're, they're not particularly nice to people, but they're making sure that they're focused on getting the best offset grade and the best outcomes in, in the GCSEs or in, in primary of key stage two. What happens is they get quick results. This is the study set. Even in the first year, they get better results. No one likes them, but they get better results. Second year, they get better results too, and then they tend to leave. They don't stay around. And what happens when they leave, the school gets, goes backwards so much, it's in a worse place than it was before they started, but everyone's pleased to see the back of them. The third kind of leader that they talked about, they called the architect. And the architect, interesting. The architects were gen genuine and, and showed, showed kindness to the staff and the students, but they focused also on systems. So they obviously did a lot of work on professional development, but also they made sure they had strong systems across the school, behavior management, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right across the school. So consistency of systems and engagement were the two things for them. They did not get results in the first year. They did not even get an improvement in results in the second year, and the governing bodies wondered whether to keep them or not. Other things are better. Attendance is better, morale is better, parental engagement is better. Teacher you learning is better, but not, not necessarily better outcomes. <coughs> Third year results go up, fourth year results go up, and even after they leave, the, the school carries on improving. That's sustainability <coughs> in terms of improvement, and that is a combination of the power side of leadership and the love side of leadership. And we have to get that balance right. Okay, the next one, improvement leaders acknowledge their mistakes and not afraid of being seen to be imperfect. And they avoid narcissism and manage the ego. I say, man I'm not saying you haven't got to have an ego. It's important to have an ego, but you have to manage it. I don't know whether you saw this headline in the Times Education Supplement a few years ago. Whatever happened to the, uh, the child of the devil, the famous five superheads? Now, these were head teachers, and I knew four of them quite well. I'd been to their schools, I didn't know the fifth one. They were all mentioned by Michael Gove in speeches in the Secretary of State as heroes. They were lauded. One, one was a dame. Uh, others were mentioned all over the place as fantastic leaders. They were in and out of sanctuary buildings, the Department of Education, in and out of number 10 Downing Street. They were seen as hugely successful, all five of them. 
all lost their jobs, four were banned from teaching and one went to prison. <laughs> <laughs> all lost their jobs, four were banned from teaching and one went to prison. Now, it's interesting, because they ran good schools. They ran good schools. So you've got to ask yourself, what was going on here? And my guess is, they thought they were so good at what they did, they could break the rules. They thought they were so successful that they knew what they were doing, everyone would allow them to break the rules. Ben Laker says, success requires a moderate fear of failure. It's the balance of such fear with the desire to excel that leads to great leadership. Those who lack this fear of failure break rules, take risks, and sense their boundaries. They are alone for themselves. So what I'm arguing here is a fear of failure is an important ingredient of good leadership. A fear of failure, a moderate fear of failure, not, not a kind of, I, I, I can't do anything approach, but a moderate fear of failure is an important ingredient of good leadership. And I want to go into some little bit more detail about that, because it's something I wrestle with in my own leadership. When you become a leader of a team or a school or an organization, you accept the fact that you are the person in charge. You put on the mantle of leadership. You are in charge. Obviously, you're working, but you accept the fact that you're in charge. And you try and lead with some gravitas and to the best of your ability. Occasionally, you come across leaders who really don't think they ought to be in charge. They think it's been a mistake. They just, they just somehow got the job and they shouldn't be there at all. And they have no confidence at all. Now, being led by someone with no confidence is not good. They're constantly asking for their approval from their team. They're going to prop them up all the time, reassure them all the time. And when things get tough, they don't lead things uh, strongly through, through, the, through the challenge of times. So you have to have a certain amount of confidence <coughs> to be a leader. Trouble is, some people who uh, become leaders put on the mantle of leadership, and they get some success, they put a crown on as well. They start to think more highly of them, themselves. They think that they know it all. They're the ones who talk all the time in meetings. You see them. Uh, they start to drink their own bath water. They, they believe their own publicity. And those kind of leaders are a nightmare too because you can't challenge them. You can't question what they're doing. You can only tell them what they know is the answer anyway. And in the end, that will lead to complacency, actually. So I share this with you because I think I've been guilty of both of these things in my leadership. There have been times, at least two times in my leadership, when for about three months, I just did not know what to do. I lacked the confidence. I couldn't work out what the strategy should be. And I was letting my organization down. And I knew that they felt that at the time. And there have been other times when I've had a lot of success that I think I've gone the other way. And I've become a bit too complacent, a bit too overconfident, and not welcoming challenge enough, and not looking outward enough to get uh, challenge back into the organization. And I know I'm at my best when I'm neither uh, well, I've got a balance between confidence and humility. Now they're overwhelmed, nor overbearing. It's a hard one to get right, actually. But it's a good place to be when you've got that balance track between confidence and humility. So we have an ego, but we manage it. And, and we know that if you have, if you combine charisma, narcissism, and power, you tend to get abuse. So we understand that. As, as imperfect leaders, we manage uh, our <coughs> ego. Perfectly make public promises because they're actually aware, they could be aware of their own weaknesses. I want to tell you a story about this one because it's an important one to, to grasp. Sometimes we, want, we have to do something, we know we should do something that's really important. It's important that we do it. But because we know we're weak and, and we, we might not do it, so we make a public promise because we want to make sure we're doing it. And I'm going to give you two examples. When I went to the National College of School Leadership, I felt that the National College at the time was a bit too clicky, it's a bit too insular. There were certain people who were really in with the National College, but loads and loads of school leaders that had nothing to do with the National College. And I wanted to send a message that when I was CEO, we'd try and change that, build a culture that was our college, all school leaders. So I was making this speech two weeks before I took up the role. It's a big conference. And I knew the Guardian and the Times Education Supplement were going to be in the, in the audience and would report what I said. And I made this promise. I said, in the first three months in the job, I'm going to telephone 500 head teachers and ask them what they think about the National College and ask them for their advice. I wanted to send a signal out 
but I was going to listen. And I chose the heads of all of the country, from, from the Thumberland to, to down to Cornwall and across every single local area, primary and secondary and special. Um, so I made that promise. Do you know, I knew it was going to be difficult, but I didn't know how hard that was going to be. Because when I was director of education at Nosley, if I phoned the school at Nosley, the head teacher took the call. But as this new person at the National College of Leeds, no one ever heard of, I couldn't get past the secretary's office. <laughs> they thought I was trying to sell something. <laughs> or, or, and the, the head was in a meeting, or Mike called me back if I was looking. And it was a nightmare to actually, and, and I made all of those 500 phone calls myself. Not even using my PA, I ran them myself. And I spoke to 500 teachers. I would have given up if I had not made a public promise to do it. It worked out one of the most important things I ever did in that job. Would make those phone calls. People still talk to me now about having got that phone call and the impact that it made. So sometimes we have to do something we know is really important, so we make a public promise that we're going to do it, to make sure that we do it. One more example. A few years ago, I decided to do the Great North Run. It's a half marathon in Newcastle. And um, I knew if I was going to do it, I'd have to train really hard and get up at half past five in the morning to go running. And I had a big job at the time, so I'd have to be half past five but I was still going to do my job. So I thought, ooh. Um, I thought, well, I need a moral purpose for that. So I, I, uh, I decided to run an aid of Macmillan cancer phone. So that gave me a moral purpose. And that didn't get me up at half past five in the morning. So I told myself, it'd be good for me. Help, I'll lose weight. I'll be healthier. And that didn't get me up at half past five in the morning. Well, got me up at half past five in the morning to go running and train to do the half marathon was I told all my colleagues, all my friends, I was going to do a half marathon the Great North Run. And I asked them to sponsor me. Having made that public promise, it would then have been unthinkable not to have done it. And that's why I got up and that's fine. So sometimes, something so important, we want to do it, we make a public promise. And that makes sure that we, got, that we address our weaknesses and still do the thing we know is important. Right, this one about lear learning leaders. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story about nosy now. You never know, there might be any, someone in the audience who, who remembers this story. But um, when I went to Nosley, <coughs> we, um, we had too many secondary schools for the number of children. Uh, and um, some of them were struggling as well. And we managed to get some funding for building schools for the future. We got, we got approval to, to build brand new secondary schools, but only eight. And we have 11 secondary schools. So I knew that this was going to be a challenge, because we'll get brand new buildings, but fewer schools. So people will be losing, some people will lose their jobs, and parents will have to take their children further away from where they used to. So it's big. So I'm, we're going to have 14 public meetings. And I thought I'd leave the public meetings myself. And the first one was in Kirby, which is a challenging part of Nosley. And it went very badly. It went very badly. Uh, I didn't handle it very well at all. It got nasty. People were shouting. Uh, someone said, uh, do you have any children? I said, no. They said, you wouldn't do this if you had children. So it got very personal. And I, I felt I just it was awful. At the end of it, after everyone had gone, I burst into tears. I thought, I've got 13 more of these to do. I can't spend the next three months in tears. I've got to find a way of handling this better than I am. So I had to ask myself this question, how can I do this better next time? And I learned that feeling good is a skill. Feeling good is a skill you work at. And you can improve your leadership by thinking about how you did it last time and trying to improve it better next time and then next time and next time. And then, then, then after a while, you can actually feel positive about the awful, difficult, challenging things that you're doing. Um, and this, uh, and by the way, what I worked out was obvious, what I should have done. First of all, be the first person there, meet them a cup of tea, talk to them. Uh, when during this meeting, listen intensively, intensely what they're saying, make eye contact, uh, with great seriousness and gravitas, build on anything positive, uh, and at the end, thank them for coming and be the last person to leave. And I worked out, I found that that really had a big impact on how I handled those meetings. So this quote, I think it's a, we all make mistakes, we all get things wrong. We have to give ourselves permission to make mistakes. But the best leaders are able to be at their best more often because they reflect on it and apply what they're learning in a more consistent way. Reducing variations in our own leadership is a great skill. 
And families aren't necessarily better leaders than the rest of us. They just operate at their best more often. So you're not trying to be a different kind of leader. You're just trying to do better next time than you did last time. That's all. You're just trying to be a better version of yourself next time. Not someone else. Just better next time than you did last time. And that is the great power of learning and leadership. Okay. Maybe finished. We've only got two more to go. Remember leaders, I encourage others to step up to leadership rather than bring them off. Don't have to be the finished product to be a leader. You know some head teachers, it's awful, but some head teachers, you see them say, she's not ready for leadership, he's not ready for leadership, she hasn't served a time yet, he hasn't done all that yet. And they're, they're kind of dismissive of people. Colleagues, nobody is ready for leadership. Nobody. Nobody is ready for leadership. It's always a big step up. And no one is the perfect finished product. We all have to learn on the job. So what kind of culture are we going to create within an organization? Is it one where people are encouraged to step up, or one where people are put off? When you step up to being a leader, what normally happens is you do less of something you know you're really good at, in order to do something you think you might be good at, but you don't know, you've never done it before. That's what requires encouragement and support. And that's our job as leaders, to encourage people to step up so you find in the organisations where the imperfect leader understands that, you have coaching, you have mentoring, you have job swaps, you have shadowing, you have all kinds of things going on that will support for leadership rather than the opposite. I used to say to head teachers, when you went into your school, who did you spot who had been neglected by the previous head teacher, who had real talent, who flourished under your leadership that didn't before? And then I used to say, who will the next head teacher spot that you've missed? Because we can get blinkered in that and we can be narrow in our thinking about where the talent is now we develop it. So as an imperfect leader, we understand that. We create a culture that encourages people to step up. And the last one is imperfect leaders are authentic. Um, genuine. If there's a book called uh, Why Should Anyone Be Led By You, written by Goffey and Jones, it's, it's an interesting question. Why should anyone be led by you? Why would they want to be led by you? And Goffey and Jones say there's two reasons why people would want to be led by you. Nothing to do with your title. Two reasons. Number one, and the most important one, they say, is the leader is genuine, authentic, honest, isn't playing games, isn't out for themselves, makes mistakes and admits them. The second reason why the people like to follow you, by the way, is that they might know what you're doing some of the time. So it's not just about authenticity. You also have to make good decisions. But that combination is really important. People admit, forgive leaders who make mistakes and admit to them, but they hate to cover up our brain culture. And actually, those who admit mistakes are actually more confident often than those who don't. You know that CEO of that charity who's opening himself up to his team because he's got confidence, not because he lacks confidence. So I said I'd talk to you about Dark Nights of the Soul. I'm going to give you two. Uh, and then I'll just try and wrap up. So, um, when I went to Nosley as Director of Education, we had the second worst GCSE results in the whole country. And after a year of our leadership, we had the worst GCSE results <laughs> in the whole country. Uh, and I went live on Radio Merseyside that morning with exam results, and they brought with respect, just give up, it's hopeless. I said, we want to do a story on the worst local authority in the country. <laughs> and uh, the Liverpool Echo had a letter in it calling for my resignation for bringing disgrace upon the borough of Nosley. This was a tough time for me as a leader. This is a dark night of the soul moment. And I thought, well, maybe I should just give up. Maybe I'm just not up to it. I can't do this. I've been in the post for eight months. And maybe I should just give up and walk away. I had a mentor who helped me to see, after a lot of discussion, that I was doing the right thing, that you needed more time. So I thought about that carefully. I decided to stay and that I was doing the right thing. So I got all their teachers together. And the heads who were there still remind me of this. I got the primaries and secondaries are all together in the room, and I said, we're having a tough time at the moment, but I'm telling you now, in three years' time, people will be coming from all over the country to find out how we've been so successful. Put it in your diaries, because it's going to happen. 
And um, actually, it did happen. We had, we had some significant success at that time. And, but what I needed to show at that moment was optimistic leadership. And that's part of our job as leaders, to show optimism, to help people see that it can get better. So that was the first dark night of the soul moment. The second dark night of the soul moment was much later, when I went to CFPT Education Trust, which later became the Education Development Trust. This is a big international charity, not for profit, working all over the world. It had a turnover of about 120 million. And um, it had been making a loss of 4 million a year for two years before I went there. Now, you cannot carry on making a loss of 4 million pounds a year because your reserves go right down and then go bust. So I did everything I could in my first year. I started halfway through the year. At the end of that year, another loss of four million. I thought, well, yeah, I'm sorry. Give me another year. And, and so I did everything the next year. did everything I possibly could to turn it around. At the end of the next year, four million pound deficit again. And we were in serious trouble, serious trouble. Um, and I thought I might get the sack. I didn't get the sack. The next year we made a profit, the next year we made a profit. By the time I left, we were making 10 million a year of profit, and it's still making a profit now, long after I've left. Now I had to ask myself, why was it? Because I thought I was, getting, I was making myself ill. I was suffering from stress, I had symptoms of, of stomach problems, I might have stomach cancer. I was making myself ill, I was sleeping. Why was it that it didn't sack me? And uh, I've come to the conclusion there was two reasons why it didn't sack me. First one was, the whole board had agreed the strategy. And I'd really pushed them on that. I was not content to say, here's my strategy, you know, what do you think, have I got your approval? I went around every single member of the board and said, has anyone else got anything to add? Or is this our collective strategy? It was very important to that. And if I hadn't done that, I think I probably would have been sacked. Because, but they, they would have, they completely agreed to the strategy that I was implementing. And the second reason I think they didn't sack me is I was absolutely honest with them all the way through. I didn't hide anything. I was really genuine. I asked for their advice constantly to say, am I missing something? I didn't hide any data. And they thought, well, he might not be commercially savvy, but he's authentic. And they gave me another chance. And like that, that with architects, they didn't get improved in the first two years, and then they improved. And it's been sustained. But those dark nights of the soul moments, it happens to a lot of leaders. And sometimes we end up being dismissed, and I could have been on both of those but um, sometimes it just takes more time. So I just want to finish off with a, a little uh, with a, a, a football thing because when I was in Nosley, I realised unless I spoke equally positively about Liverpool and Everton, I'd lose half the workforce. Okay, but I am thinking a little bit about football now. I'm a Newcastle supporter myself, so I'm not a Liverpool supporter. But if you think about imperfect leadership. Um, in 2004, this is what Jose Mourinho said, please don't say I'm arrogant. What I say is true. I am European champion. I'm not one of the bottle, I'm a special one. That was a quote from Jose Mourinho. I didn't say my team is the European champion. I am European champion. And I'm a special one. Now, he had a great deal of success. So you can be successful if you think you're perfect. You can be successful. Tend not to sustain it can be successful. I think most people agree that Liverpool have got a good football team. <laughs> okay? uh, and I, I'm, I say that not as a Liverpool fan. Here's a quote from Jurgen Klopp. I know I'm good at a couple of things. Really good at a few things, and that's enough. My confidence is big enough. I need to let people grow next to me. I need experts around me. That's what leadership is. Have strong people around with better knowledge in different departments than yourself. Don't act like you know everything. Be ready to admit that. That's not a real philosophy. He's summarising what I've just been spending the next the last hour saying. He's saying, I can do some things well, but I can't do other things well. I know my strengths and my weaknesses. I've got enough confidence to be able to develop talent around me. I ask, I, I, I welcome experts. I bring other experts around to help to have a powerful, perfect team. I don't act like I know it all. I admit my mistakes. He's doing pretty well, isn't he? He's doing pretty well. And he's an imperfect leader. So just this last story, and then I'm stopping. Um, I used to do a lot of work in Africa in my last job. And uh, I went to a slum in Nairobi. 
And um, I went to visit school there. And that's a sewer. It's an open sewer. And about for a mile in all directions, stinks. And in order to get to their school, the children have to walk over the sewer into their school. Like walk through, over that plank, and that's their school there. Now, it's hard to think of a worse environment for learning than that. I mean, you may have some issues uh, in Merseyside, but this is quite extreme. I, hope, I think you'd agree. But when the children get into the school, they're absolutely delighted to be in the school. Absolutely delighted to be in the school. And I asked the head teacher, the guy kneeling down there, I said, why are you here in this really horrible environment? Why are you doing this? He said, these children have no hope of that. No, he said, their parents never went to school. They're dirt poor. Without education, they have no hope. That's why I'm here. That's such a powerful thing to experience for me. And I thought, well, actually, that's, we may be in a different environment here on the side, but it's still the case that without education, our children don't have hope that they need. And that's why we do it. That's why all of us are involved in education, to give hope to the children and young people. And I worked out, by the way, but as in Africa, the, the Maasai warriors, when they greet each other, sometimes they don't say hello. Sometimes they say, Kishirengera, which means how goes it with our children. Because the Maasai believe this is going well for the children, not going well for the whole community. And they don't say, how goes it with your children, which you might expect. They say, how goes it with our children? That sense of collective responsibility. The key question as educated we ask ourselves is, how goes it with talk a lot within teacher education and within the education system of the importance of mentors um, and that's we're usually thinking of our beginning teachers but actually that makes a lot of sense all the way through and that idea of always needing them um, so thank you for your insights I, I think you were willing I don't know if anyone's got any questions or reflections or anything they'd like to add um, I know there's a lot, lot to think about in there <laughs> Can I ask something? I don't know if you've got an opinion. I, I think the idea of, um, on a big system level, of, of, of love, of collaboration and working together um, seems quite difficult sometimes at the moment. Um, have you got any thoughts about how leaders um, connect with each other and, and, and work together um, when often they're possibly put into situations where the system has them Maybe it's around pupils and attracting numbers, or you know, there's lots of tensions um, that work against collaboration. Uh, and the main one is the accountability system, which judges you on your own school, uh, great, uh, other offset grades you on your own school, performance results on your own school. So if you spend time and energy helping yeah. school, uh, the worry is that there's no recognition of that. It's just, unless you, it's all judged on your own school. It's like I, I use the analogy. You're in a, like in a fishbowl, it's your school. Now you might be like everything that's going on in the fishbowl, but it's familiar. You know the rules. You know what's expected of you. And if you ask them to collaborate, you jump into a lake. And in the lake there's some strange fish in there that, you know, <laughs> they're not like you. And, the, and the, the kind of energy required to jump and, and change things is you know, quite daunting. So you prefer to stay in the fishbowl. It's safe. But actually, unless we go into the lake, our system will not improve. We might have a good school, but our system will not improve. The only way to improve the system is through knowledge sharing and through collaboration. Every system in the world would say that. I work all over the world now. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Singapore, all over. It's the case everywhere. The only way to improve the system is through collaboration. So I, I, what I'm arguing here is that um, you have to take into account Ofsted. You have to take into account uh, school numbers, you have to take pupil numbers, you have to take into account uh, 
examination results. But you can't let it rule you. I know, I know you have to take into account. But what you, you say, OK, what do our children need? What does our community need? And they work together with other schools to take collective responsibility for the children in your area. And that is a powerful thing to do. And that shows leadership rather than victimhood. For me, that's a challenge. But when you, when you see it happening, you see powerful learning going on. And it's better for the children. But don't collaborate for the sake of it. Collaborate in the interest of the children. Say, in order to collaborate, what are we going to do The three years down the road we'll be better for the children if we don't do it? Ask yourself that question. If you can answer that question by saying, in three years' time, it's going to be better for the children in this way, and then that's how you can do it. And be upfront about that. Put it on your website. In three years' time, this is, we're holding us, holding ourselves collectively accountable that it's going to be better for our children. It doesn't have to be literacy. It could be, it could be sport, but it could be something that you are combined together to do in the interest of the children and to prepare to be collectively accountable for that. I think when you see that happening, when you see it in places around the world, that's when it's really powerful. Any other? Oh, yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? You, you said about um, seeing education systems around the world. Where do you think they've got it most right? <laughs> Uh, right, uh, how much time have I got? <laughs> okay, so I think what's, if you have a really effective system, you have to have a balance between accountability and capacity building. So you need both in a system, like power and love, you need accountability and capacity building. What we have in England is a completely skewed system where accountability is very, very, very high and capacity building is low. I, and I'm, I'm saying this without um, hesitation. We have the highest stakes accountability system in the world, in England. anywhere in the world. There's no, and I go nowhere in the world is the highest stakes accountability in the world. And by that I mean there's nowhere <coughs> in the world where a head teacher is more likely to be dismissed based on examination results or inspection. Anywhere in the world. I thought maybe North Korea, but I looked into it, and North Korea <laughs> is, is not as bad as England. England has the highest stakes in business in the world. So it's completely skewed. So where you have a better balance, it helps a great deal. And England has a lot of good things. I mean, it has great leadership. Leadership in England in schools, I think, is as good as anywhere in the world. But it's got skewed on the accountability capacity building. So where you see a better balance would be um, this in Canada, where you've got medium stakes. You've still got accountability, still got examination results. Uh, but there's more of some capacity building. If you talk to uh, leaders in education in Canada, they'll say there are some teachers and head teachers in the system, there are very, very few who are in the wrong job. They shouldn't be teaching, they shouldn't be leading. We have to ease them out. But there's another 10% who are struggling, and that's our fault, not theirs, and we have to help them. You don't get that in. You don't, it's a completely different scenario. So, so how you put support in and have to uh, a sense of being empowered rather than a sense of just being criticised. So I think you see a like, good balance in, in Canada, though Ontario is going through a bad time at the moment, but Alberta and, and British Columbia are good examples. Uh, obviously Singapore, but Singapore is such an unusual uh, system because it's non-democratic and very small. But you find the head teachers there are empowered. Um, and, um, you know, I would say you shouldn't compare systems, but I would, uh, Australia say no, Australia's not got it right. I would say Canada's very right. I mean. What's Michael Gove like anyway? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am. Um, <laughs> we'll stop recording. <laughs> I, uh, I, I've written about this in the book. I've also written about Dominic Cummings in the book as well, by the way. Because I had quite a few meetings with him when I was in, in, in at the National College. I didn't know he'd be running the country. Uh, I described all that coming into the book as rude and moody. And now he's running the country. So, um, But Michael Gove, um, I've got to say, I say this in the book, I was completely taken in by him in the first 18 months of the job. I, I, I thought he was genuine. I thought he was, um, he was always charming. He was a good listener. I, I thought he was committed to tackling disadvantage and narrowing the gap. And I was a big fan. And then I decided that I was wrong. Uh, and I, I decided that um, I watched it change. And I found that 
He started off with power and love and ended up just with power. He stopped talking to a wider group of people and he ended up just talking to his friend, people agreed with him. Uh, he, he started with an open big tent and then ended, ended up with a closed tent. And he started to say one thing to one group and another thing to another group. So I went really off him. And actually, it's an example of power out love because he ended up being toxic, didn't he? And they had to get rid of him because he was going to lose votes in the general election. So he was always charming and very clever. The two brightest I worked with for five seconds in the state, the two brightest ones were Ed Balls and Michael Gold, in my view, significantly both terrifically able in different ways, completely different personalities. <coughs> Michael Gold was always charming, but I went, I, I just lost, I lost trust in him. Yeah. Just sort of building on that, really. I'm just really interested on your reflection of emotional intelligence, which is something that we look at in our master's programmes here. And I just wonder whether you think all leaders are capable of emotional intelligence. Okay, well, that's a, that's a, <laughs> there's a few issues there. First of all, I think leadership is more about um, behaviours than roles. So, I think you can be a leader as a student in a classroom, you can be a leader as a support system in a school by, by behaving in a, in a leadership way rather than because you've got the title. That's the first point I want to make. So it's, it's more a way of behaving than a, uh, than a job title. Secondly, um, I genuinely believe that leadership can be developed. Uh, if I didn't do believe that, I wouldn't have been chief executive of the National College for School Leadership, because that was our job to develop leaders. So you can learn by watching, by copying, by, by trying, by learning, the kind of things I've been talking about, including listening skills, uh, observing body language, uh, demonstrating empathy, all of that can be developed and learned. Um, I think there are some people who start off with a much easier uh, task than others. And that's a challenge. And there may be some people for whom, so I, I've got a friend who's got an autistic child, and he's dead straight and genuine, but he doesn't pick up any of the nuances yes, at all. Yeah. So, and I think it does help if you have the, the intelligence to pick up the nuances. But um, So yeah, A, it's not a job, it's a behavior. B, everyone can learn to be a better leader. And C, there are some individuals who find that really hard. Well, Okay, I think we need to finish. Um, can I just say again, thank you so much for sharing so many um, honest and genuine insights. Um, and I, I think uh, we've already uh, benefited from hearing them. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.